to the opening prayer. Father God, I want to pray and ask that all of us are open in terms of our minds and spirit to receive your word, O oh God, and that, Lord, you touch our hearts to yield the ground necessary for true transformation to your praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. So, Rabbi, yes, you have been waiting. Thank you. All right, let's jump into this. Psalm 53, verse 1 to 3 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. And every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Alrighty, so that's uh, that's Psalm 53, verse 1 to 3. And uh, I'll also go to Romans. Now, Romans is a well-known passage. And uh, I think for me, it, it really gives a very, very interesting scenario of what's going on today. And so when we look at skepticism, you will understand how it all ties up to this particular scripture. So let me just read it out. I'll read it first in the NLT. And then later on, somewhere in the middle of our, of our lessons, I will turn um, into reading from the um, message version. Brandon Moyer, I love you, sir. Leo, though I lost your line. Really, you did? Oh, shame. Now nah, we'll, we'll make a plan so that we get the line back. Leo, I remember we've been interacting, uh, Leo. Uh, I have your number, so I think I'll send you a message. But, I mean, I'm online right now, so I can't. Right, so the Bible reads in the book of uh, Romans 1, verse 18, all the way to the end, it says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. In other words, nature speaks by itself about who God is. Yes, they knew God, <clears throat> but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused, claiming to be wise they instead became utter fools. That's your skeptic right there. And instead of worshipping God, the, glo the, the glorious ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So these are your nature worshippers. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turning against women, burning with lust for one another, men did shameful things with other men and as a result of sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Now since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that they should never that should never be done. Their lives became full of every wick kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. Okay, they are backstabbers, they are haters of God, insolent. Proud and boastful. Whenever I read that part, I remember hip hop. Proud and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. Now, you see the whole thing about disobedience to parents? It's so biblical. All right? They refuse to understand. They break their promises. They are heartless and have no mercy whatsoever. They know God's justice requires that those who do such things deserve to die. Yet they do them anyway. Worse still, they encourage others to do them too. You know how they encourage others to do them? Through film, through entertainment, through the media. Anyway, we'll get to that. So let's, let's, let's jump into this now. I want us to go deeper into the study of skepticism. So um, let's begin with defining it. Okay, so there are several definitions to this particular spell. And by the way, somebody asked me, why do you call these things spells? And you know, I, I think people do not understand 
the term spell. So let me show you what the dictionary definition of a spell is. Because I think a lot of people just don't understand the implication. All right? So uh, a spell, especially from a magical charm, is this. Listen. A form of words used as a magical charm or incantation. All right? So that's very interesting. And then when one is under a spell, it means they are not fully in control of one's thoughts and actions. Under someone's spell means so devoted to someone that they seem to have magic power over them. So, in other words, um, you know, this, this is an idea where someone is literally placed in a state that they stop thinking for themselves and they begin to follow whatever has been dictated to them. So, when we talk about spells here, beyond just magic, I'm talking about coming under the control of teachings, ideas, concepts. And I want you to understand something even more profound. Let me show you uh, something a lot of people don't normally see. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter, chapter 4 verse 10. <clears throat> this is a very, very powerful scripture. Many of you know it. Many of you know it. Um, where, where are we now? Chapter 10 verse 4. I think it's chapter 10 verse 4. My bad. So it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. My bad, my bad. So the spiritual war. Okay, so, so for the weapons, um, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down, count this now, arguments, and every high thing that exalts exalt itself against the knowledge, bringing every thought into captivity, to the obedience of Christ. Do you see that? So what 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 exactly are the 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 weapons of warfare fighting down? First, they are casting down arguments. Then they are bringing down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And then they are bringing into captivity what every thought. Now, did you notice that arguments, knowledge, and thoughts all exist in what realm? The mental realm. So you people need to understand that the greatest warfare we face today isn't some demons flying around in heaven where people spend the whole night praying over them. No. The greatest warfare we're facing today is the warfare of ideas, my friends. Ideas. So what you have to understand is when an idea is created, it is sent out as a meme. Okay? So meme. So that idea of a meme is that it comes into the realm of somebody's mind and using very clever psychology. These guys have understood the psychology of imagery, the psychology of music and all these tools. They are able to then bring a person under a spell. And the spell is really just planting the idea into the minds of a, mind of a person. So you could call it, you could call it a conception. Okay, conception. But if you plant ideas well enough and you create the environment and factors well enough, then they could get into a state of inception. They now birth an idea from within themselves based on what the environment placed in them in the past. We call that priming. So you have to understand that these are very smart people and they know the idea. So when I use the word spell, it's on purpose. I want you to understand that every idea, every time you watch television, every time you read books, every time you're on social media, every time you watch those funny videos you're throwing around with each other, those are ideas. That's the weapon being utilized by the enemy of our souls. And it is doing a phenomenal job in priming people, in jamming people, in numbing people, in desensitizing people, in decoying people, in differentiating people, in literally shifting them from a position of righteousness to a position of unrighteousness. So they are very smart. And so skepticism is another example of how they bring an argument. Okay, so that's it. You bring an argument. And what's that argument doing? Raising itself up against the knowledge of God, which is God's law, God's precepts, God's word. So what does this do? It comes up to counter these things. And then what does it do? Then it captivates the thoughts and minds of people. 
So Otensha is saying spells tend to control the victim's behavior. Thoughts example idolizing thoughts example idolizing a role model, especially a musician. Correct. So if that musician becomes somebody you love, when they do things which are not right, because you love them, you tend to justify and rationalize. I always like that word. You rationalize their behavior. To rationalize means to create lies that are rational. So rational lies. So you do that to yourself and you say, no, I'm sure it's okay. I'm sure there must be some spiritual meaning to this. So, so oh, I think it's okay. I think those are old fashioned. I think, and by the way, you must remember that over time, they've been consistently dropping these mind bombs on you through media. That's why we call it memes or meme nomics. Memes. So I'm sure a number of you remember Johnny Men uh, Mnemonic. M mnemonics is the concept of creating ideas that can spur and control an individual in a very profound way to bring about an end. Um, if you ever watch the movie The Manchurian Candidate with uh, Denzel Washington and Lee Stryber, that's the same idea of planting. Now that's a bit more extreme because obviously of the story behind the movie, they were creating assassins that would commit murder without realizing. But the idea is that you plant these seeds and concepts and then people don't realize so that later on, when confronted with a scenario or situation, they are not able to argue because you've already been priming them. You have been preparing them. You have been setting them up. So this weapons of warfare being mighty in God, people don't understand. You know what a stronghold is? As a, as a person who teaches uh, uh, cognitive science and as an NLP practitioner, I can tell you that a stronghold is your mind. In your mind, there's something called the reticular activating system. That system is your strong man inside of you. I'm not going to go into that because I've got no time. That's not the lesson we're tackling today. So you just need to understand that when I use the word spell, it's very deliberate. Because I know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an incantation made by words, images, and symbols with sound, usually to the accompaniment of music, which then breaks down the RAS barrier because it's been shown that music is the one medium that can dull the RAS. The RAS does not activate because it is, it is uh, mesmerized by the music. So music has, an, has a hypnotic effect. Music is able to tap into your emotional centers of your mind. And move it, music can then move you emotionally, whether it's into dancing or it's into crying or feeling melancholy. It doesn't really matter what people call worship, whatever it is. Music will create that emotional state in you. And so that's why we say music creates an atmosphere. Whether it's a positive or negative atmosphere is a topic for another day. But the point is it creates an atmosphere. So what that does, that atmosphere, is it breaks down the reticular acti activation system, which normally barriers your mind from listening to things. And so good musicians will use powerful music, and then they'll use powerful lyrics, which are pushing across an agenda or a concept, and then people sing along, and they don't realize they're actually singing to a concept they would normally not agree with. I'll give you a very good example, but then I might be using a song that you, you may not be aware of because it's a very, very old song. But uh, the Beatles did a song called, uh, actually several of them. You know, the Beatles were deep into the stuff, but I, I'm, I think I'm going to talk about, let me think, let me think, let me think which song can I use for the Beatles. Sgt. Pepper was praising Peter Pan and Alistair Crowley. Most people never knew that the song Sgt. Pepper was actually about Alistair Crowley. Uh, many people didn't know that, for example, uh, Elton John, when singing about Daniel, he wasn't singing about his brother, but he was singing about his gay partner. Now, now we can go into many examples, but you know, you sing along, Daniel, my brother, you are more than a friend. Do you still feel the same? So you're singing this song and you don't actually realize that you're singing about a gay relationship. So, so it's a very clever way of, 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 of jamming people 
you know, the, the music is really good, the lyrics are awesome, the, the tune is amazing. And so you sing along, but you don't realize that as you sing along, you're actually embracing this thing. What favorite example has got to be Rolling Stone's Sympathy for the Devil. That song is so catchy. And a number of us have watched movies where the song plays. And, and, and I mean, the most recent is Cruella. You know, Cruella is one crazy character. One of the things I've been doing so effectively in the spell casting is to use a negative char uh, character. For example, Cruella, those who know 101 Dalmatians, Cruella's always been the bad one. She's the one, the evil queen, that's trying to capture all the Dalmatians and turn them into, into, into what, what, you know, should make outfits out of them, out of their skin. Cruella gets a movie of our own, and in that movie, they sympathize with her. So we get a backstory to why Cruella becomes Cruella. It's very similar to Maleficent, that's the Angelina Jolie movie, where she's playing the witch that actually causes Sleeping Beauty to go to sleep. So if you know the fairy tale Sleeping Beauty, the witch made a spindle, she was spinning it, a pin pricked her, and she went to sleep for a hundred years, the whole kingdom went to sleep, and it took the kiss of a prince or whatever. So, so it's one of those old uh, fairy tales. But what's interesting is that that particular movie, Maleficent, we get the backstory of the black witch. We get the story of why she became a witch. And then we get a sympathetic view of her. Now, coming back to Rolling Stones, Sympathy for the Devil is a song literally about the devil. It is the devil speaking his own words about who he has been, how long he's been around, how he tempted Jesus, how he's been painted bad, but in actual fact he's a good guy just trying to do his job. Very interesting. And of course we know now you've got the TV series Lucifer, which actually paints the devil as this cool, handsome guy trying to help humanity. Totally misunderstood. So that, my friends, is what I mean when I talk about the memes of culture that are completely spellbinding people into a twisted view of reality. So that's where I'm coming from. So let's go back to the spell of, of, of skepticism. I just thought I should give you a background why I keep using spell, spell, spell everywhere. It's just to help you understand that really we are dealing with spells here. This is no joke, ladies and gentlemen. These Hollywood, television, social media, these are the tools of the modern wizard that is used to desensitize individuals from the reality of his existence and the acceptance of wickedness as good. Right, so now there are several definitions of this spell of uh, skepticism, as well as subjects within the wide spectrum of the word itself. So in order to do them justice, I will define generally and then move specifically into one that is of consequence here, that being religious skepticism. So I will definitely zero in on that. Now, in order to, in ordinary usage, skepticism is to think, to look about, to consider, according to the Merriam-Webster uh, Merriam Dictionary, as a, an attitude of doubt or a disposition to incredulity, either in general or toward a particular object, then B, the doctrine, now that's interesting, because people argue about this, but the doctrine that true knowledge or knowledge in a particular area is uncertain. Or C, the method of suspended judgment, systematic doubt, or criticism that is characteristic of skeptics. Now, uh, a lot of you may not be aware of this, but I actually did a personality trait test on myself, and I discovered that my personality is that I'm a skeptic. I didn't know this, but I learned it. So it explains why I question so much. It explains why I don't buy into a lot, but... Even though I have a, a skeptical nature by mind, I am truly a believer in Jesus Christ. I really do believe who Jesus is because I had an opportunity to experience him at a personal level. Okay? So, um, now let me just see what Asenic has said. He's written something very interesting, so let's see if we can read it out. He says, an idle mind, ideas in the realm of the mind are quite similar to latent scripts or images which are not visible to the human eye without special devices or laser technology or processing. I'm loving this revelation. True that. True that. I like that. So we, we, you, you will learn even more, my brother. So let's continue. Now, isn't it ironic? It's a hot day today. 
Isn't it ironic that skepticism can be termed a doctrine? Thank you, Cholo. Yes, MK Ultra and Operation Paperclip are some of the methods in which jamming worked effectively, and they're now using it mass scale. And they're doing it even on social media as we speak. So, isn't it ironic that skepticism is termed a doctrine? Did you know that, the skept that skepticism and atheism require the same amount of faith to stand on? Did you also know that atheists are some of the most narrow-minded, closed and difficult people to carry out a logical and systematic discussion with? Okay? It is possible to carry out a discussion with a skeptic because by nature, skepticism questions then believes upon seeing evidence. Okay? Whereas an atheist does not accept the evidence, they just deny it. The reason is because it takes a very dogmatic stance to ignore all the evidence in nature for the existence of an intelligent designer. I mean, you have to be really, you have to be something akin to a knucklehead to refuse to accept that these things have been created by someone. To actually say, I mean, it's like me holding this up and telling you, this appeared after five million years. It's just showed up, you know, five billion years. This just showed up. You'd say, dude, spare me the crap. Because it's crap. It's definitely somebody designed this. Now, if this thing has been designed and has a designer, you think nature can just show up? Please. We did do a series on this, so we've already explained it. So, skepticism is actually divided into three distinct types. This is scientific, religious, and philosophical. So let's look at those real quick. So, scientific uh, skepticism uh, would be defined as, <clears throat> is, okay, scientific, let's start with the scientific one. Now, a scientific or empirical skeptic is one who questions beliefs on the basis of scientific understanding. Most scientists, being scientific skeptics, test the reliability of certain kinds of claims by subjecting them to a systematic investigation using some form of scientific method. And as a result, a number of claims are considered pseudoscience if they are found to improperly apply or ignore the fundamental aspects of the scientific method. So scientific skepticism does not address religious beliefs since these beliefs are by definition outside the realm of systematic and empirical testing or knowledge. So that's very, very important. Then religious skepticism generally refers to doubting given religious beliefs or claims. Historically, religious skepticism can be traced back to Socrates who doubted many religious claims of the time. So modern religious skepticism practically places more emphasis on scientific and historical methods or where are we um i'm lost i've lost my section where are we where are we all uh, right 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 then blanket non-acceptance okay for this reason religious skeptics will for example believe that jesus actually existed since he can be historically attested to but if not a Christian, will likely question whether or not he performed miracles. So the existence of Jesus is denied by people who choose to just be dumb and obtuse. So historically, it is true the man walked the earth. Okay. The only issue a scientific and religious skeptic would do is to question whether the miracles were really miracles or it was just a lack of knowledge of the time. So was it really demoniacs or was it epilepsy? You know, that kind of thing. So religious skepticism is not the same as atheism or agnosticism. Religious people are generally skeptical about claims of other religions, at least when the two denominations conflict in some stated belief. That's the one. <clears throat> Philosophical uh, skepticism, uh, which is also Pyrrhonism, is a position that refrains from making truth claims, okay? A philosophical skeptic does not claim that truth is impossible, which would be a truth claim. <laughs> so the label is commonly used to describe other philosophies which appear similar to philosophical skepticism, such as academic skepticism, an ancient variant of Platonism that claimed knowledge of truth was impossible, okay? Empiricism is closely related, but not identical, Position to philosophical skepticism. So empiricists see empiricism as a pragmatic compromise between philosophical and nomothetic science. Philosophical skepticism is in turn sometimes referred to as radical empiricism. Okay, so very, very important as well. Now let me see what uh, Dexter has to say here. So Dexter says, we all believe in something. The atheist believes in himself, precisely. And that's why I say atheism is a religion and, him, and humanism is, is its philosophy. Because humanism puts man at the center. So everything is centered around man.
okay? Knowing enough that there isn't an all-knowing creator is in fact claiming that there are uh, the all-knowing ones and believe in their claims. And that's my point. Today, we, we, we've been having, the, I posted something on my wall and it's caused a small storm because the humanists are on my case. We will do humanism as a topic next on the next, uh, after this one. So you'll see it's very interesting and you'll be amazed how many people come up to argue when we talk about humanism. So the history of, uh, of, of, of this position, philosophical skepticism originated in ancient Greek philosophy. The Greek sophists of the 5th century BC were of the most part skeptics. So Pyrrhonism uh, was a school of skepticism founded by Anesidemus in the 1st century BC and recorded by Sextus Empiricus in the late 2nd century or early 3rd century AD. Now, one of the first proponents was Pyrrho himself. That's where the whole Pyrrhonism comes from. So Pyrrho of Elis, who existed circa 367, uh, 275 BC, and he traveled and studied as far as India and propounded the adoption of practical skepticism. So subsequently in the new academy, Asselius, or Asselius, sorry, who lived around 315 to 241 BC and uh, Carnidius, these names, 213 to 129 BC, developed more theoretical perspectives which, uh, by which conceptions of absolute truth and falsity were refuted as uncertain. So Carnidius uh, criticized the view of dogmatists, especially supporters of Stoicism, asserting that absolute certainty of knowledge is impossible. So he was what you call a typical philosophical um, uh, skeptic. All right? This is around... 200 AD, so 200 years after the church. Now, the main authority for Greek skepticism developed the position further, uh, incorporating aspects of empiricism into the basis for asserting knowledge. So, Greek skeptics criticized the Stoics, accusing them of dogmatism, and for skeptics, the logical mode of argument was untenable as it relied on propositions which could not be said to either be true or false without relying on further propositions. So what I want you to do, those of you that are very interested in this space, uh, I like that. Grayford says he's a theistic existentialist. Interesting com 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 uh, uh, topic there, because I think I'm also one of those. But I am a skeptic by nature, so I'll let you know. All right, so for those interested in further study of this subject, please research and read The Five Tropes of Agrippa the Skeptic. Very interesting, because for those of you who want to know deep stuff about this, you can go there. Now, the skeptics argued the two propositions could not rely on each other as this would create a circular argument as P implies Q and Q implies P. So nobody wants that. So for the skeptics, such logic was thus an inadequate measure of truth and could create as many problems as it claimed to have solved. So therefore, according to the skeptic, truth was not, however, necessarily unobtainable, but rather an idea which did not yet exist in pure form. Now, you and I, who are theists, know that the truth did manifest his name was Jesus, but that's a topic for another day. So skeptics, although skeptics were accused of denying the possibility of truth, in fact, it appears to have mainly been a critical school which merely claimed that logicians had not discovered truth. So, Rene Descartes is credited for developing a global skepticism as a thought experiment in his attempt to find absolute certainty on which to base the foundations of his philosophy. Descartes discussed skepticism or skeptical arguments from a dreaming and radical deception. And then David Hume has also been described as a global skeptic. However, Descartes was not ostensibly a skeptic and developed his theory of absolute certainty to disprove other skeptics who argued that there is no certainty. So, where are we today when it comes to skepticism? So, current trends state that is in this day and age, skepticism is an approach to strange or unusual claims where doubt is preferred to believe. So, given a lack of conclusive evidence, okay, skeptics generally consider beliefs in the extraterrestrial hypothesis and psychic powers as misguided, okay, since no empirical evidence supports, you know, such phenomena. Ancient Greek philosopher Plato believed that to release another person from ignorance despite their initial resistance is a great and noble thing. So that's why atheists and skeptics kind of make it a mission to go after us theists. Okay? 
Modern skeptical writers address this question in a variety of ways. Okay, so Bertrand Russell argued that individual actions are based upon the beliefs of the person acting, and if the beliefs are unsupported by evidence, then such beliefs can lead to destructive actions. Okay, this is one point where skepticism is in direct conflict with faith. Now, James Randi also often writes on this issue of fraud by psychics and faith healers. Again, here is a case where blanket criticism and conclusions negate the many hundreds of cases of genuine healing with empirical and recorded evidence to support the same. There are certain, certainly many uh, charlatans in this area as you would have the genuine. And you know, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a skeptic, I have seen miracles firsthand. I can tell you two which I've seen with my own eyes. The first, I saw somebody stand up and walk from a wheelchair a white man that became one of my spiritual parents sometime in the past. Uh, Bishop Alan Chinnery had been wheelchair bound for 10 years. At the word of a preacher, Bishop Moses Kulala, a man that I was translating for in a town called Reading in the, U in, in the UK, that man walked off his chair. There was no drama. There was no semantics. There was no acrobatics. He simply told him, do you believe in the name of Jesus? Do you believe Jesus is the same today as he was in the past? The man answered yes. And what happened? He commanded the man and told him, then in that same Jesus, stand up and walk. And Bishop stood up. That story was so profound and well known in Reading that it was even featured on West Anglia television, uh, the BBC version of that area. He featured there. Doctors came through to examine him. They had images of pictures of his crushed disc and his, his severed um, spine from his waist down. All that information was there. He was on disability allowance for many years. So that's a real story. I saw the man walk. He never sat again or, or got on a wheelchair again till the day he died. That was a first class miracle I saw happen instantaneously under the environment of a preaching of a servant of God. The second miracle I saw with my own eyes, which I experienced firsthand, was my own mother who had been diagnosed with uh, fourth stage cancer with three months to live in 2016, October, November. I remember this clearly because I had, I went for a seven day prayer in the mountain to pray for my mother and to pray for her healing. And she also stood very strongly in her belief of healing. Many, many members of our family and people stood to pray and believe her healing. My mother also understood the power of the use of natural remedies and herbs. And even though she began the chemotherapy in view of the advanced stage of this cancer, she stood and believed for healing and so did I and so did many and we saw God's hand move 100% she was healed of the cancer after two months the cancer went in remission to this day this is now 2021 end of 2021 my mom is as fit as a fiddle going around doing her business as if she never had stage 4 cancer with three months to live and a serious spread of the disease and on chemo so when we talk about healing, it's not something I speak from power. When we talk about miracles, I could start giving you story after story. We could finish this whole hour on miracle after miracle, which I have witnessed. I have witnessed the impossible. I witnessed a girl that is demon possessed who spoke in a language she had no idea about. This is a Colombian girl. And I was with this bishop in a meeting. This Colombian girl began to speak a demon began to speak through her. Turns out, for the sake of the story, I'll be quick with this. Turns out that that girl was possessed by a very powerful spirit entity from her family. When she began to speak and, no and make noise, my bishop stood in the middle of that service and, to and pointed at that demon. My bishop couldn't speak fluent English, so he used to speak Swahili and I would translate. He stood up in the middle of that meeting and just pointed to that girl and told her, Silent! Just one word, no, 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 in the name of, the, she just said, silent. The demon went quiet, told her, sit down. She sat. And that's how she never moved from there until the end of the service. The man of God went to this woman 
after the service was done, people left. Uh, my, my bishop and the background I come from, we don't, we don't do that, you know, demons on TVs with microphone. That's total rubbish. That's rubbish. That is not genuine ministry. Genuine ministry which involves deliverance and demon uh, casting out is not something you do in public because of the implications. Again, not a topic for today. And so my bishop went there to this girl. And he addressed the demon in the girl. And he was speaking in Swahili. This is a girl who is Colombian from South America. The demon not only responded in Swahili, but they carried out a conversation in Swahili, a language this girl never knew or understood or could even speak. Zoraida was her name. You know, it was so mind-blowing. As a person who came from an occultic background and got saved, that incident really showed me the reality of the demonic world in ways that nothing else can do. And so from that point forward, I now understood that this other realm isn't a joke. And I understood a lot about it from the occultic stand. But when I saw that demonstration of power, it really put my understanding of the things of God at a whole new level. My skepticism basically went out the window for good in that space. So I understand demonic oppression and I understand psychological problems. We, I, I was in the room with youth when this girl, because after she had been helped, Bishop told us, because he had to leave, he said, this girl, her spirit is tied to legal grounds. You must proceed and do one. He gave us instructions of what to do with this girl over the next month. So we all used to go there as youth to pray with her, to stand with her. She loved Jesus, but she was it is like terribly tormented by the spirit. And I remember two incidents that were so supernatural. These were what we now call in, um, in, uh, in pseudoscience, in paranormal studies or parapsychology. We could call these incidents what we call manifestations of, uh, of what I'm going to term paranormal manifestation so so it's not ectoplasm it's not any of that but it's basically the manifestation of things from another realm into this realm the first is this girl was able there's a time she actually vomited hair like hair like something straight out of the, mo the horror movie the grudge that's how freaky it was like literal hair came out of her mouth long hair that freaked me out second incident as we were praying for her on another day the demon got so mad and you know it was so hilarious because you know i know we didn't know a lot of things but we we're doing what we could then the demon said none of you are going to stay in this room and we told him we told the demon to be quiet and then they are manifested the smell so bad none of us remained in that room and that smell was not coming from her it was coming literally from the room a very foul offensive rotten smell it was shocking. Nobody remained. We all left the room. We all left the house. That was the end of that session. So those are the kind of manifestations we witnessed. I witnessed as a, as a believer in my early days in the Lord. <clears throat> and so my skepticism of things spiritual basically went out the window. I, I, I now invested in a lot of books to understand the spiritual world from a Christian standpoint. Because remember, my understanding of the spiritual world was from an atheist, not atheistic, sorry, from an occultic standpoint. So those are examples of seeing how this manifestation happened. So let's go on. So critics of alternative medicine often point to bad advice given by unqualified practitioners, agreed, leading to serious injury or death. Richard Dawkins points to religion as a source of violence, notably in his book, The God Delusion. This, this was a, a bestseller. It really, really fed the excitement of the atheistic movement, Richard Dawkins. Now, some skeptics, such as the members of the Skeptics Guide to the Universe podcast, oppose certain cults and new religious movements. Most, most major religions, including Christianity, God, pseudoscience, homeopathy, etc., because of their concern about what they consider false miracles performed or endorsed by the leadership of the group. They often criticize belief systems which they believe to be idiosyncratic 
bizarre or irrational. And that's why I came with my testimonies because I disagree with that. Now, Penn and Teller Bull <laughs> was a very, very interesting series. You can actually find it on uh, YouTube. It's an American documentary television series that aired from 2003 to 2010 on the premium cable channels Showtime and in, Can in Canada on the Movie Network and Movie Central was hosted by a professional magician, two of them, uh, pro two professional magicians and comedians and skeptics Penn and Teller themselves. Now, they generally either debated the political topic or aimed to debunk pseudoscientific ideas, paranormal beliefs, and popular fads and misconceptions, often from a libertarian point of view. Okay, the political philosophy espoused by both Penn and Teller. Now, the show criticized proponents of what they perceived as nonsense or dishonesty, often citing ulterior political or financial motives. Now, the stated aim of the show was to apply critical thinking to misconceptions. Now, paranormal subjects of the episode include, among other subjects, the literal exegesis of the Bible. Penn and Teller approached the topics in a manner of Harry Houdini and James Randi. Okay? Uh, who what, who has appeared, by the way, more times, more than once on the show, and who are known for debunking claims of supernatural power. So these guys were big in just debunking everything. So what is the spell itself? What's the spell itself? So before I go to the spell, let me see what Asenic's question is. Esther, glad to have you. Uh, Asenic has a question. He says, what effect does skepticism have on human intelligence, i.e. academics, and human behavior in a community setting? And then two, can we attribute success and failures to achieve perceived satisfaction as influenced by skeptical tenets, or is it just a matter of laziness? Very good questions. I think these are deep questions, so I'm going to handle them a bit later. But let's start with the first one. The second one I'll come back to. Now, what effect does skepticism have on human intelligence, such as academics and human behavior? I think, to be honest, scientific reason, if you want to operate scientifically well, you must start with a healthy dose of, of skepticism. That's very important. I think you would be doing yourself a massive disservice if you didn't operate with a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, this is true even within the Christian church. But then, when you choose to ignore the truth of God's word, then it becomes a problem. What I've found about the word of God is that it brings light and gives understanding to the simple. That's what Psalm says. It says, we must... Allow the word of God to get into our heart. So even the ostentatious question is easy to answer. How can we escape the spell of skepticism? Allow God's word to bring illumination in your mind. Not the words of a pastor. Not even my words I'm teaching right now. Allow God's pure word. So find the Bible and make the Bible your staple diet. Find a good concordance. Find a good commentary. Balance commentary, by the way, don't go get a commentary written by a known extremist, especially in the charismatic circles. I think those are not going to help you. So find somebody that walks middle of the way. They're not easy to find, but there are plenty. So if you go to a sober Bible school, if you get a sober, critically acclaimed uh, concordance, but not concordance, but mainly um, a, a commentary, Matthew Henry is one of the most respected uh, commentaries of the Bible. I like David Guzik. David Guzik combines a number of well-known teachers and he, he puts them together to form a very, very modern, very open commentary. Covers all sides of the argument. Both are conservative, liberal, charismatic. All sides of the argument. So he brings this data, places it in there, and uses that as a commentary on a line-by-line -line basis of the entire Bible. Matthew Henry is very respected. So the beauty about such is that when you begin to study scripture using such commentary, believe me, your skepticism will, will, will turn to a healthy one. Because there is bad skepticism and there's healthy skepticism. I like to claim that I'm a healthy skeptic, but then you never know these things. But I just think I don't take any cock and bull story from anybody. It doesn't matter who preaches the message, including my own father in the Lord, I will go to check that message out. The Bereans of Acts, the book of Acts, were an example of individuals that had healthy skepticism. Though Paul was a powerful man of God, they went to check what he said against scripture. That's very important. If somebody makes a claim and it's preposterous, 
Ask them where they get it from the Bible. And when you go to that passage of the Bible, learn to read the Bible contextually and historically. That's extremely important. Get the context of why Jesus said what he said. So, for example, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. You know, that sword to divide mother and daughter, son and father, you know, sister and brother, and, and to, to, to divide nations. Now, what kind of sword is that? You see, if you, if you take that passage out of context, you would then behave like the crusaders. That's taking it out of context. What Jesus? What is the sword? I came to bring a sword. What's the sword? The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. You see? So the, the word of God is the sword of the spirit. The book of Ephesians says the word of God is the sword of the spirit. Taking the sword of the spirit. Okay? So it's an offensive weapon in our spiritual weapons of warfare. So it's very important to understand context when you're reading scripture. Don't just take scriptures out of context because you are very likely to end up with misinterpretation and serious error, which we've seen in a lot of Christianity. So that's what Jesus meant by the sword. I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. So it sounds like he's contradicting himself, but it's not. The sword of the spirit, God's word. So when you're studying scripture, Otentious, you need to understand that let the word in its whole counsel speak to you. And when there are issues of doctrine, let doctrine be guided by your position within the denomination you sit under. I'm big on denominationalism. Why am I big on denominationalism? Because I think looking at the state of the church today, denominationalism is one of the best ways in which we can protect the integrity of doctrine and belief by the confines of those denominations. Now, some denominations are too dogmatic and too closed. And that's why I say that if you can focus on God's word and let God's word speak to you, not what your denomination tells you, if you can let God's word speak to you, not what your pastor tells you, you'll be amazed how much your mind will open up. You'll be amazed how much freedom and understanding God will bring into your mind to grasp the truth of his word. So that's very, very important in understanding where we're going. Now, let me quickly, uh, the second question I'll handle later, Let's quickly finish this. So what is the spell of skepticism exactly to the world? So here's the spell. Now hear it. Why should we always believe what the establishment says? If we cannot prove it, then it's not true. All must be proven scientifically through a repeatable methodology that can be duplicated anywhere, anytime. Only when something comes under scientific scrutiny and passes the test can it be accepted. It must be devoid of all emotional or bias. It must undergo rigorous scrutiny and testing to prove its authenticity. That's the, that's the spell. Further, there is no absolute truth because all truth is subject to those that seek it. No truth can be objective, only subjective. And as such, whether you may seek to prove as true, sorry, as such, whatever you may seek to prove as true will be tainted or altered by the very act of seeking that truth. The Heisenberg certainty principle attests to this. All testing will invariably affect the subject undergoing that test to such an extent that we cannot get the absolute truth or absolute fact. Okay? So since nothing can be absolutely proven as true or false, we must continuously subject all our statements, laws, and beliefs to the lens of critical thinking. With this, we can thus say creation cannot be proven. God cannot be proven. The soul, the spirit, all these cannot be scientifically proven and thus they are left in the realm of pseudoscience, superstition, and those not yet exposed to civilization. Modern science is God and man is the center of that God. We can create and destroy our reality by the power of our minds. We can change our future by that same power. God is in fact inside of us and we are God. The God of science is the God of the skeptic. Reason or logic is that God. And since science is the brainchild of man, this means that man is God and all starts and ends with man. And that exactly is how skepticism feeds into humanism. So that, my friends, is the spell. So I'm going to pause a bit there because you can see just how profound that statement is. That, my friend, is the skepticism spell. Let's see how this spell has come to the church. But before I do, 
let me go back. I promise to read the message. Now I want, now you heard what the spell was. Now let me read you the message version of the same scripture I read earlier. Romans 1 verse 18. Now the message is like really simplified. So it's not a great Bible to study. But it's a great Bible for comprehension. I don't like to study it because the gentleman who wrote this had to do a lot of Eugene uh, Peterson. He had to do a lot of, you know, diluting it to make it make sense of like the Good News Bible. But it's a very nice Bible when you want to kind of get the gist of what a passage is saying, especially if it's in all that Bible jargon and, you know, the, the terminologies that don't make sense. So it's a nice one. But I like NLT more uh, if, when it comes to that. But my favorite version of the Bible any day is New King James Version. All right, so let's read this. But God's angry displeasure erupts as, an, as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. Interesting. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes as such can't see. Eternal power. For instance... And the mystery of his divine being. So nobody has a good excuse. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well. But when they didn't treat him like God. Refusing to worship him. They trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion. So that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all. But were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God. Who holds the whole world in his hands. For cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. I like that. So God said in effect, if that's what you want, that's what you get. It wasn't long before they were living in a pigeon smeared with pig pen, sorry, smeared with filth. Filth inside, filth outside. And all this because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshipped the God they made instead of the God who made them. The God we bless, the God we bl who blesses us, oh yes. Worse followed, refusing to know God, they soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women. Men didn't know how to be men. Sexually confused, they abused and defiled one another. Women with women, men with men, all lust, no love. And then they paid for it, oh how they paid for it. Emptied of God and love, godless and, love, and loveless wretches. And since then, and so rather, since they didn't bother to acknowledge God, God quit bothering them and let them run loose. And then all hell break, broke loose. Rampant evil, grabbing and grasping, vicious backstabbing. They made life hell on earth with their envy, wanton killing, bickering and cheating. Look at them. Mean-spirited, venomous, fork-tongued God-bashers. Okay? Bullies, swaggerers, insufferable windbags. They keep inventing new ways of wrecking lives. They ditch their parents when they get in the way. Stupid, slimy, cruel, cold-blooded. And it's not as if they don't know better. They know perfectly well they are spitting in God's face. And they don't care. Worse, they hand out prizes to those who do the worst things best. Hmm. So I find the, 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 the word, uh, the, the, this version, very, very eye-opening. And uh, you see for yourself, that is what skepticism leads to. It leads to a state of pride that is difficult to understand. Let's quickly look at the last part now, the spell to the church, and we'll wrap this up. When it comes to the church, many would argue and think that skepticism has not had a spell over it, yet I'm going to demonstrate that this spell has been around for a long time and has had adverse effect on the church in ways that are pro uh, profound and mind-closing. And if by nature skeptics are closed to anything that is in the realm of faith, the church suffers from one terrible spell under its umbrella. Religious dogma. Hear me. Religious dogma. Dogma. Okay. The challenge with this is that once people are taught what is termed the right way to live their lives based on rules and rituals or denominationalism, man tends to embrace this as truth and chooses to stick to it no matter what comes to challenge his view. 
Now, whilst this may be a good thing when it comes to living in obedience, the danger is that we become so familiar with the rules and regulations that we end up blind to the move of God. So let me show you seven areas where the skepticism role has killed faith in the church. All right? So seven areas, and uh, uh, I really need to skip. There's a lot. I'm, I'm not going to go very deep into this. But number one is the whole concept of being born again. Okay, religious dogma always pushes the concept of works over faith and in the finished work of the cross. Religion wants people to keep working in order to gain access into heaven. They are taught to believe that somehow if they can do good and get the scales to tip more heavily towards good, this will get them an entry ticket to heaven. When the truth is shown that our salvation is not by works but by faith in Christ, they reject this believing that somehow this is a teaching from those charismatics and Pentecostals. Let me tell you that there is a big move in this area to push for religiosity and churchianity. So I'm not going to go into details. So that's the first area which is affected. The second is being baptized in the Holy Ghost. With the departure of Christ, Jesus promised a helper will come and lead us into all truth and will give us the power to live a victorious Christian life. And that power, dunamis, shall come from above and be generated within us because Christ lives in us and we have received the Holy Spirit. Now when this happens, our lives are dramatically transformed and many times manifesting the power of God through the various gifts as listed in various portions of scripture. The most obvious being those listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 11, namely the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Nine. Now these gifts are given liberally by the Holy Spirit and are essential in making the Christian minister more effective in their work here on earth. And unfortunately, religious dogma has made many who could have potentially become recipients of these gifts to be rejected and in certain instances even suppressed. I know a number of people from some mainstream denominations who are very skeptical about this baptism of the Holy Spirit, who then experienced it so powerfully and involuntarily such that the experience left them dumbfounded and resigned to its truth. And this led to many either leaving their denominations and beginning a process of influence uh, of change from within. That's very difficult, but they have. So, number three, experiencing the miraculous. That's another area that skepticism has blocked. You see this, again, like I've told you, I have seen miracle after miracle, but the, 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 the problem is that these skeptics within the church have shut all this down. Number four, living the abundant life. And I think this one is really, really sad. Okay? Unfortunately, so many have believed that somehow God does not want them to walk in abundance and blessings, that poverty is somehow equal to piety, a lie. And this is another lie from the church and from the spell of hell. And they have fallen under the spell to believe that poverty, sickness, suffering, pain, misery, and misfortune are somehow God's will. I can tell you they are not. Now the challenge with our Christian faith is that all that God has promised must first be believed by faith, then understood or internalized by revelation, and then appropriated by the spoken and confessed state of mind. Now the concept of appropriation is one where an individual goes to place a claim on what is theirs. Abundant life, favor, and blessings belong to the children of God. But unless they ask for them, unless they appropriate them, they may not get them. All right? The fifth one is demonic oppression and possession. This is serious stuff. I don't even have time to go into this. But it's another area that is so deep that a lot of people have failed to understand and have been oppressed immensely. Number six is generational curses. I do deep teachings on this. This stuff is real, ladies and gentlemen. Generational curses are real. And lastly, eschatology. It's a pity some sectors of the church, for example, the Seventh-day Adventists, teach a lot of eschatology. It's so sad that the Pentecostal movement and many mainstream denominations don't teach eschatology. And no wonder many people cannot recognize the works of darkness when they show up. So having said that, ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the end of this topic. I can't go deeper because it's too, too detailed. But I can tell you that the secret of coming out of all this is to learn to allow God's word to go deep into you and cause a transformation. So what I'm going to do as I close, I'm going to ask you who are watching, if you want me to go deeper and into the section of skepticism on the spell to the church, let me know in the comments after this. 
I will watch those comments over the next few days. And if many of you, if more than five people tell me that we need to go deep into the spell on the church, then we will make that the topic next week. So we'll pick it up as part two on skepticism and study the spell on the church deeper. So if not, then we can go straight to humanism. So from myself, thank you so much, everyone. 